Hello there and welcome to the Second Life Book Club. My name is Traxter Dupre. Today's guest is feminist researcher and author Joy Watson. In her debut novel, The Other Me, which is out now from Caravan Press, the main protagonist, Lolly, grows up in apartheid South Africa in an abusive household with an alcoholic mom. And when her beloved grandmother dies and then subsequently the mother thinks spiral out of control lolly gets adopted by a white family she herself is colored we're going to talk about that that term uh today as well but she passes as white this book is in first person and it's quite remarkable that uh that joy manages to convey the world through lolly's eyes now lolly comes from this background of trauma and abuse, and she does some very, very bad things, but she's also a product of a pretty messed up uh, patriarchal society. Um, it, it, it's a remarkable book that through personal relationships and with all this, you know, the apartheid and the patriarchy sort of in the background, Joy really doesn't touch on it that much explicitly but she con conveys that and um i'm very much looking forward to the conversation because today I, I i hope that we will demystify why literature and books and fiction you know lies stories that that are untrue can can contain a deeper truth than uh, the best i don't know sociological study or, or or even or even documentary anyways I would like to welcome Joy Watson to the show. How are you, Joy? I'm very well, and thank you for having me. I really appreciate being here and looking out on the all the, the interesting people. Um, thank you for for coming. I do appreciate it. We have a we have a we have a completely full house today. Uh, maybe the camera can can zoom back and show us. And we also uh, we're in the house of Karina Shurek, who uh, who is the uh, uh, the, the the boss over at Caravan Press that publishes your book. And I want to start today with, with a reading uh, right away. Mm -hmm. Usually we start the reading a little bit later, but I would like to start early so we can get a little bit of the of the texture and of the feel of your book. And you chose chapter four. Can you set the scene a little bit? Where are we in the story? Sure. So this is early on in the story. It is... Um after Lolly's grandmother, her beloved Oma, has had a heart attack and died. And Oma really was the person who anchored her, who was the force of stability in the life of, of in both her life and her brother Lelo's. And it's important to right, so she has a brother and and it's important that the Oma, the grandmother, is um is the anchor, like you said, because the abuse comes through the mother who is an alcoholic and, and, you know, her various boyfriends, uh, that are, that are, uh, physically abusive. So this is the funeral. Let's, let's go right into it. Here's Joy Watson reading from the other me. Oma was buried on a Saturday morning. The sun shone brightly like nothing had happened and the sky was a radiant blue. Auntie Ida came at seven in the morning to pick up Lelo and me. Mommy was not yet back from her night out. Auntie Ida looked put out and said that it was a crying shame, but that it's not like the dead can sit around waiting for people. The show must go on. She fussed over us, straightening out pretend creases and tidying our hair. I hovered somewhere outside of myself, watching from a distance. At the church, there was an open viewing of the coffin before the service began. An organ played in the background while a line of people waited to pay their respects. When our turn came, Auntie Ida pushed us forward, insisting that we kiss Oma. The purple blue woman in the coffin wearing Oma's best church dress and fake pearls was not my Oma. When I was little, I used to think that there were two of me. The real me was the girl who belonged to Jesus. The other me was not a nice person. She did bad things. When I saw Oma in the coffin, it was the other Oma. Later, she would come to visit me in my dreams, whispering things in my ear. 
When Lelo saw the other Omar, he screamed, and Auntie Sherry tut-tutted and said that the house of the Lord was no place for drama. After the service, we went to the graveyard. The priest did the burial rites, saying solemnly, The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Then they lowered the other Omar into a big hole as the women's brigade sang Amazing Grace. Lelo squeezed my hand, looking worried. He leaned over and whispered to me, Lolly, where's Omar? I mean, like right now, at this very moment. They say she's gone to Jesus, Lelo. But where exactly is Jesus? I mean, if he's like up in the sky, why are we putting Omar in the ground? How will she find her way in the dark? I'm scared. He started to cry, and I put my arms around him and said, I don't know, but remember how we act out our stories? I think we should talk to Oma and act out our story as if though she's still here. Auntie Sherry saw us talking, gave us the evil eye, and bustled over. In a whisper so loud she need not have bothered, she said, We must respect the dead. The hand of Satan makes us do many things. She patted Lelo on the head and took his hand in hers while she used the other to dab at her eyes. After the funeral, we went to Auntie Ida's house. The women at the church had been up until late preparing the food. Oma was well loved. It was evident in the pots of acne, the finger sandwiches and the many baked goods. I sat on a chair in the lounge, losing myself in the intricate pattern of leaves on the tablecloth. Around me were the sounds of life carrying on, aunties calling out about heating more food, tea being poured into dainty cups, people telling stories about Omar. The Omar they talked about seemed like a shadow to me. I didn't know the woman in them. She was like a jigsaw puzzle to which I only had some of the pieces. One of the aunties told us about a time when the women's brigade went on a church outing to Stellenbosch. On the bus ride, someone put music on. Oma stood up and started dancing, clicking her fingers and swaying her hips. I did not know this Oma, the woman who danced. The Oma who was not buried in domestic chores. I had not met the woman who could stop in her tracks and swing her hips to the beat of a song. Lost in these thoughts, I missed the exact moment when the front door opened and Mommy walked in. Auntie Ida moved across the room like a bolt of lightning. In a high-pitched voice, her hands folded, she said, Good afternoon, Maureen. I'm so relieved that you could make it. I said a silent prayer that for once, Mommy would shut up and behave herself. Good afternoon, Ida. I came as soon as I could. I'm not the kind of person to miss my own mother's funeral. I did my level best to get here on time. She picked up a plate and began piling it with a mountain of acne. Auntie Ida's cheeks went red. Maureen, you must forgive me, but I think that someone needs to point out that you did in fact miss your mother's funeral. I really did not want to be the one to say something, but it's not respectful. Mommy looked incredulous. She glanced behind her, behind her as if trying to find the person to whom Auntie Ida was talking. When it became clear that all eyes were on her, she rolled her own and said, are you fucking serious? No, no, Maureen, no need for language. I won't have you coming here wearing, by the way, a dress with cleavage and being rude. Your mother's gone and I really worry about what will happen to your children. Mommy was weighing her words. Sucking in her teeth, she said, Ida, you really are something. You have to stop worrying about me and worry about your own family. Because why? When that dirty husband of yours decided that you wasn't good enough when you spread those fat legs of yours, we all know who he came running to. Now I'm going to get me some of my mommy's funeral food and then I will be on my way. Red in the face, Auntie Ida excused herself, saying that she needed to put the kettle on. When mommy was done eating, she made a great show of gathering us up. It's bedtime, children, and we have to get home. It was four in the afternoon and she had never before put us to bed. And that is Joy Watson reading from The Other Me. Joy, uh, wonderful, wonderful reading. Big round of applause. I mean, this sets the scene perfectly of this dysfunctional 
uh, family. Uh, now, Joy, behind you uh, has appeared a um, a armchair. Please right click and sit on it, and then the armchair will move you uh, next to the fireplace because it's getting a little cold. <laughs> so I'm can... right clicking, and I desperately want to sit in it. Uh... Yes, sure. right click and sit here. And in the meantime, if you're just tuning in, this is the Second Life Book Club with Joy Watson. The book is The Other Me. It's out from Caravan Press. And um, the the interesting thing here is that Lolly does, as I said in the in the outset, Lolly does some very bad things. I mean, even criminal things. I don't want to spoil anything. But she is a product of of a terribly misogynistic uh, racist society. I mean, this is uh, this is apartheid South South Africa. Uh, our researchers, Shyla and Monkey, have brought us a few quotes that you made in in, a, in other interviews. And if the camera could go on the overhead projector, this is very interesting. Uh, I didn't read these interviews. This is what the researchers do of this book club team. I read the work and they do the research. It's a great, um, it's a great uh, uh, sharing of work. You said in an interview, it was interesting to me to see how readers were able to see the fault lines in the w woman character, but were mostly blind to the fact that the man in the story is equally horrific. Now, Lolly gets married and the guy seems nice at first and then he he hits her uh he has affairs and because you tell the story through this through first per, a lot of first person and she does all these horrible things it, it makes it very difficult uh to take sides so i think this is quite brilliant because you know it shows that things are complex uh, things are not black and white so um if if you sit on the chair then we'll move the chair back and then we'll uh, we'll sit by the fireplace place. I'm not sure Oops. why my um, uh, trackpad is not letting me right click and sit. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, well, then then we'll just have you. Um, we'll have Stand. you standing. <laughs> we'll have you standing there. That's good. Um, if you want, if you want to turn around and just right click the chair, then you you can sit down, but you don't have to. No problem. It's Let easy. me move the lectern. Behind me. Let, let, let's focus on the conversation. Don't worry sure. about the chair. Um, you didn't make it easy on yourself by by using Lolly, this this very problematic character who does terrible things, as a first person, right? <laughs> right. No, that was in fact. Um, I realized that they it it, it was risky to do. Yeah. And yeah, so, you know, but I, I felt that um, I wanted to take a chance with this. It's very hard to take a character that is uh, not likable, um, who's unreliable, but also does some pretty um, messed up things. Um, you know, there's the very real risk that the reader uh, does not identify with her. And um, that 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 voice, her voice, is something that is so alien to them that they just invest in the book. So that was, um, you know, I imagine that people would would actually give you quite a few bad reviews because what you pointed out now is interesting, because the voice. It's always her voice, and she sometimes says, "Oh my God, these people are effing ridiculous, and why do I even do this?" She's very calculating. It 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 makes it difficult to because we only hear the story through her voice all the time. Her voice, and and that is interesting because I initially told the story through um, a few points of view. So one was her, uh, the man she falls in love with, Siddiq. And another character called Nerine. And um, I gave it to my sister, who's also a writer, to read. And I trust her very much. And when she read it, she said that the thing about Lolly is that her voice is so powerful that but when every time I get to the alternating chapters and it's in another character's voice, I'm not as right. invested. And so that meant um, quite a lot of work for me because I had to go back and rewrite 
those chapters all through Lolly's point of view, which, you know, it, it meant that I lost some, some material in the sense that you don't get to see how the other characters view her. But I, I guess that, you know, in the end, Mary was right that her voice was so um, omnipresent, so powerful that it just actually worked better to, to keep her, um, her voice all the way through. But it, as I said, it was also a risk, and and I, you know, I was really hoping that it would um, that it would work. That, and and I think I guess in some ways that's why I hope that the backstory, creating an understanding of her background, the socioeconomic context, um, the sense of trauma in her life. The, the trauma of, that is really the key. Yeah. Yeah, an intergenerational trauma. Um, so I hope that that would explain some of what she does, but without exonerating her. This and is so interesting that you actually tried tried it the other way, jumping back and forth with different voices. I didn't. I th this is so fascinating to me. And then you realize, no, I'm going to take the risk of telling the entire story through this very problematic character. I have an idea, Joy. I'm going to read. I'm going to uh, uh, read from chapter 45. Th gives you time to to sit down on the chair. Um, I'm going to read, I'm not going to read a half as good um, as Joy, of course, uh, because, uh, well, I'm I'm just not, Joy is, might be the best reader that we ever had. So I'm going to squeeze in here and um, and read from chapter 45, and then and then Joy can sit down and, and join us over at the fireplace. I'm going to keep time. And you know what I'm going to do? Um, I'm going to have to come back into uh, this world many times because I'm determined to learn it. Uh, yeah, I'm just really struggling with... Um, the don't worry about it. No, no, no. Don't worry. I mean, this, this, this it's, it's all good. Uh, now it feels you, it feels very rude to have my back to you though. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm now I'm standing I'm standing next to you and and admiring your sunglasses. Very stylish. I could never afford those. Monkey put an interesting link here about intergenerational trauma, and we'll talk more about that. So Joy, take your time sitting, and then the chair will magically move back. I'm going to read from chapter 45. Joy just mentioned that Lolly's husband, his name is Sedik, and he's a black man. Um, and he, uh, his family is Muslim. Um, it, there, there's a lot, there, there's a lot there in, in, in the background. It's fascinating, but keep in mind that the main character, Lolly is basically, uh, is colored, but she passes as white. So she, when she gets adopted by this white family, nobody asks any questions. Everybody just assumes she is a biological child. Uh, and I'm going to read from chapter 45 where they had uh, already marital problems. And the other lolly, this is a little bit of the, of maybe a, a slightly horror type of um, genre. I don't want to call it trope, but uh, the other lolly appears uh, out of nowhere and she is, uh, she's bad. So here it goes. So obviously I had a meltdown when I realized that Sadiq had left me for someone else. But once I had a chance to calm down and think things through, I realized what was going on. A midlife crisis, a niche that had to be scratched. Initially, when I found the card from Nyreen, that's the affair that he has, all I could think about was how much I hated him, how I wanted to get revenge. The other lolly had wanted me to go for the kill, as in literally go for the kill. But I had come to see things differently. We all have our moments when we have itches. Boom. One day you wake up and suddenly the first person who walks past you on the street is the person you want to have sex with. This shit happens. I tried explaining this to other lolly. At the time, she had been singing, The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want, trying to explain to me that even through Sadiq, uh, though Sadiq would be walking in death's dark veil, he should fear no ill that there was redemption in death. But following Nareen around had made me realize that it was impossible that he would choose her over me. Sure, it was unacceptable that he had whacked me hard across the face, totally unforgivable. But Sia, that's her friend, was right. It was uncharacteristic and maybe would never happen again. So I decided to give Sadiq another chance, even though other Lolly had ended up yelling at me, then leaving and slamming the door. 
I called him on Tuesday saying, it's stupid that we're not talking. We could do better. He'd agreed that we had history together, that it made no sense to ignore each other. I asked if he would come over for dinner to my place to find a way of being amicable through the divorce. He said that he was relieved that I was being so mature about things. And also he said we needed to talk about the fact that while we were married in community of property, technically speaking, the flat had been a gift from his parents to him and so on and so forth. Now, uh, Lolly here is plotting uh, to get back uh, her boyfriend or her husband. Um, here we go. Is uh, Joy all seated? Are we good to go? This is also a, a fabulous um, excerpt where you can see that she's trying to con kind of contain her her anger. And the other Lolly, I'm giving away a little bit of a spoiler here. The other Lolly is talking into her ear actually suggesting to kill uh, people that she doesn't like, including her ex-husband. Joy, are you good? I'm good. Um, you know, what I love about the audience is that they're so very polite. While you were reading the extract, I tried to sit and fell, <laughs> fell down. Oh. Um, and everybody was very polite about it. So this is fantastic. I'm going to keep standing because it's okay. clearly not working to right click. Um, right. and, and I don't want to cause any more intergenerational <laughs> avatar trauma. I just realized we're creating a new trauma loop here by making you, forcing you to sit here. Uh, at least you're not standing on the cat, which is difficult because this is Karina Shurek's home and there are so many cats. We actually had to de had to delete a few cats earlier. Uh, sorry, I don't know where they the went. Unforgivable. They went into... <laughs> we can't hurt the cats. <laughs> now, how does... Growing up African, but passing as white. Uh, oh, oh, first of all, explain to me, because in our pre-show um, uh, talk, you, you talked that the term color, that's a term you use. Maybe go a little bit into your own history. This is, to me, fascinating. Maybe let's ask, how does Lolly's story, passing as white, uh, re relate to your own story, if, if, it, if it does at all? So... It, it doesn't quite relate to, to, to my own story, um, except that, you know, I, I come from uh, um, a group of people that in apartheid were, were classified as, as colored people. So it's, it's people, you know, it's no, there's no homogenous sort of colored identity um, within this group of people. Was a, it, it really was a broad brushstrokes group where it was... Uh, all the sort of in-between people, the brown people, you would have your people who were mixed race, but also people of um, Khoisan descent. Um, and so and so these are the people who uh, grew in Cape Town, um, were under the Group Areas Act, as was the case with my family, were moved to the Cape Flats, which is um, sort of dry um, part of Cape Town. And, and so, you know, I, within the um, um, the terminology and the language of the liberation movement um, and the anti-apartheid movement, um, colored people identified, well, let me say not all, but many identified the primary, primary marker, um, uh, identity marker was that of being black. Mm -hmm. um, but... Not all, because obviously apartheid created a system where there were layers and 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 a hierarchy, and and that was meant to keep um, groups, uh, the enmity between groups, and so so there's you know there are the, the 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 effect of that systemic kind of racism was that some kind of people saw themselves as being better than being black. And, and they were, um, you know, the, the few who had themselves, who were either uh, fair-skinned enough, or had green eyes, whatever, who um, had this, went, underwent a test um, by which they could get reclassified as being white. We did have- Wow, so they had to go through a, this was like a government uh, issue test? Yes, it was. Where it was then on their papers in an official way, they, Yes. They were uh, reclassified. Mm -hmm. So there was a series of 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 um, tests that they you would have to undergo in order to at a, an official level to get yourself reclassified. 
Um, and these were, you know, they were ridiculous. One of them being the sort of pencil test where a pencil was put through someone's hair and if it fell out, it meant that your hair was sleek enough and that was counted in your favor as being white. Oh. Whereas if the pencil got stuck, um, that means that your hair was more coarse and that you were more likely to be black. Um, so within the sort of scope of identity politics of South Africa, um, you know, it, it really is kind of... Um, Part of that searching for who we are and 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 who apartheid made us be and um, and for many of us, you know, like really, uh, I, holding on to that 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 primary identity as being black, but also making space for the specificities of experience, um, uh, which are very particular to located in place and time. Um, and it's, you know, it's, no, no, go ahead, go ahead. So it's temporal, right? I mean, like culture, mm -hmm. groups of people aren't static. They change over time um, and it's fluid. Uh, it's fluid and yeah. it's hierarchical. I find it so fascinating that these hierarchies uh, exist then and, and, and these different markers, well, I'm better than you because I got this different eye color and we always... You know, I mean, this is what I want to actually have on my ranch. I want to talk about the the issue of uh, of identity politics a little bit, as 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 well as this as this pertains to to politics, because uh, the issue is of of course that everything is lumped into okay. Here's the black community. Here's the white community, and completely brushing over these. Uh, these nuances, but 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 one thing uh, that uh, occurs to me now, because this is also an educational program, I need you, if you could, attempt to to tell us briefly what apartheid uh, was, uh, in 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 your words, how you how you saw it. I mean, it's it's a uh, it's a state uh, mandated segregation. Uh, regime. I put up a slide here, maybe the camera can zoom in. Apartheid uh, officially reigned from 1948 to 1991, but the first multiracial election was actually 1994. So I don't know how familiar people are with it, but it would be very interesting if you could just, in your own words, kind of describe what, how you would describe apartheid to like an alien coming from outer space? Here in these images, you see, uh, you see uh, people in um, in really a dismal housing, but you also see protests. We demand freedom. You see a sign here that says "caution, be beware of natives." Uh, and then Shyla also put together a slide here with some uh, pictures of. Uh, old signs, European hospital this way, non-European hospital hospital showing in the other way. Then here's a sign that says danger natives, Indians, and coloreds. If you enter these premises at night, you will be listed as missing. Armed guards shoot on sight, savage dogs devour the corpse. You have been warned. This, this is a real sign. Here's a sign at the beach, white area, and here's a bunch of signs, European ladies, European gentlemen, non-European women, non-European men. Anyways, I know this is an impossible question. Joy, can you answer uh, so, what, is, what um, was apartheid? In three sentences or less. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> so it's a system basically of systemic racism um, entrenched through the legislative framework. Um, and it operated at three broad levels politically. Um, it meant that black people were allowed no political rights, couldn't vote. Um, economically, it meant that you had no economic power. Um, the quality of your life was that you lived um, to a life basically of enforced poverty, restricted to living on the outskirts, from uh, on the periphery of towns, far away from the economic hubs. And socially, um, you were kept segregated from other race groups. So that was the whole premise that the, as far as possible to keep um, groups apart, and um, and and the system worked very well in some ways because you know, as in the illustration of the some people wanting to get reclassified, it became entrenched in their minds, you know, and it kind of um, uh, infiltrated their way of thinking. And 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 these people, by the way, were you know, were seen to be traitors, to to be selling out. 
And in fact, you know, I love that you have the science because there's a piece in the book, um, The Other Me, that actually is based on a, a, an actual experience that my sister and I had. Um, so there's a scene where Lolly goes with her sister to the beach. And this is a scene from my childhood. Uh, we only ever had one holiday outside of Cape Town in, in Durban, where Isabel's from. And um, Mary and I went up to the beach and we were super excited, you know, first ever holiday out of town. And we get there and we little and I see a sign that really confuses me. It says, um, uh, whites only. And I guess, I mean, you know, I understood about in, entrenched racism and systemic racism. But I understood you have not nothing. seen it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but I had seen it. It's just that in my naive child's mind, I thought that if we go on holiday, that things are special and that that, that nothing would somehow, uh, you know, encroach upon the, the childlike innocence and enjoyment of that. And so when I saw the sign, I then um, said to Mary, I want to go back. And I wasn't sure if she had seen it. And she told me after writing this book that, in fact, she had and that she remembers she remembers feeling devastated and crushed and disappointed. And so we go back and we decide that in, if we can't get to actually swim in the sea, we'll do the next best thing, which is to pretend. And so we throw ourselves down on the floor and we pretend that we swim and we then pretend that we're laying our towels out and we um, suntan. And in fact, I, you know, when I tell the story, I say we enjoy it as much as is possible. Mm -hmm. It's as if it is the real thing without it being the real thing. And I guess that that also speaks to the power of imagination and the mind. Yep. Um, but it's not, it wasn't at that point that I realized the horror of that experience the dehumanization of that experience. It is as an adult looking back that I realize that no child should have to go through that. This is amazing. And the only way is to, uh, what is the term? It's like a, it's an internal emigration. I get, I forgot there is, there is a term like this where you're saying you imagine things to be better. I mean, this is what, what people also yeah. do who are, who are deeply traumatized, right? Yeah, and in fact, you know, my sisters live abroad, um, uh, and they came back in November um, they, to do a ritual. My dad had passed, and they weren't able to come in times of COVID. And we did a trip back to our childhood home, and they were, especially the one sister, she was so horrified. She kept saying, did we come from the ghettos? This is not how I remember this place. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it also speaks to the power of the imagination to – you know, when you live in a place, because I think that our sense of going in there and driving through there was that they were fearful, um, having been removed from the place, seeing how, you know, it looks like the people kind of dealing drugs on the streets. Um, it was yeah. dangerous today. But that wasn't our experience when we were there. Um, and it's certainly now, you know, in having kind of shifted class positions, um, two of my sisters having sp shifted spatial location, being uh, living in more developed parts of the world. Um, mm -hmm. It's interesting how you look back and you realize that that place, which in my childhood memory was a place of grandeur and splendor, uh, looks so very different through adult through an adult prism. An adult prison, but also, like you said, if you climb the ladder in the class structure, then you also uh, look look back from your from your new part of the ladder, and you look down on the ladder, and you go like, "Oh my God, down on the on that ladder, yeah. that ladder is pretty rotten." Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 absolutely. This is fascinating. Uh, thank you for for sharing these stories. In in the book, Lolly is very. Uh, th this how you're you're fleshing this out and and like i said in the beginning what is fascinating you you really don't go into the detail of what happened uh you know in 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 south african society at the time when they when your characters grow up it's so fascinating that when you're cognizant of even just perfectly cognizant of of what happened uh through these personal stories you you convey this this trauma so so well like th the main character is is traumatized and she feels that the only way to succeed or to survive i mean not even succeed 
I guess I guess like she, she is kind of ambitious in in a certain sense, but basically, uh, she uh, resorts to being extremely calculating. So she gets adopted by the white family. It's an affluent neighborhood. Uh, she plays by the rules. She um, tries to, you know, find out what what are the rules and then play by them or play as as best as 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 anybody be the be the top player and one phrase that she uses a lot when something goes awry like when people kind of see through that she's just sort of playing that or if she um has a conflict in her reflection of what happened she says oh i was dropping the ball with that person i find that so mm -hmm. fascinating right like when she's like oh uh, now she's upset with me, or or now they 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 don't call me anymore. Ah, I was dropping the ball. So every relationship, I'm talking primarily about relationship, not only with her husband, also with friends and coworkers, it's all about nonstop, twenty four seven, playing someone else. And now mm -hmm. my question to you is, what what's the what's the percentage with this character of of the trauma? that that is the reason for, for for living that life or even without the specific abuse in the family the trauma of of living in this apartheid society you know it's 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 a huge question and i maybe want to preface answering it by saying that i'm very very interested in the notion of intergenerational trauma in what um apartheid and systems of racial oppression do to people um, and how that trauma and that pain is encoded in their DNA and how they pass this on to their children. And, you know, I say this as, as somebody who's also very haunted by the loss of my, my parents. And, you know, I had good parents. They did the, the best that they could. And it, and it, you know, I kind of had a, a, a decent enough childhood. But I also lived through seeing the moments in which my parents were dehumanized. You know, I I, I hold the fact that my dad uh, was a very intelligent man. You know, he had the aspiration to want to to study, to learn, to go to university, and that that was denied to him. And he was, as a result, a very anger angry man. And I'm and I'm very interested in how whether consciously or, or unconsciously, how parents write their stories onto their children, how they write their trauma onto their children. And so in some ways I was experimenting with this in the book in um, putting Lolly in a, in a socioeconomic context that is real and, um, mm -hmm. you know, that, that Cape, Platt's, Cape Platt's back um, story is something that somebody said to me once at, a, at a, a, a reading of the book that, you know, we think that Lolly is fictional, but in fact, this woman was a counselor and she said, um, I see lollies turn up for counselling all the time. People are so scarred by the horror of what they have to live through that they have lost it has impacted on their mental health. They've lost a part of themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so you know, really just to interject real quick, because I know this is a huge question, but but I, I was deliberately asking that to, to get on this trajectory because a lot of people would propose very, very simplistic solutions. They would say, oh, yeah, of course, but you know, if we give them economic opportunity, then everything will be solved. People talk about opportunity, which does not mean anything is guaranteed. That means the opportunity is there. Maybe a good step in the right direction. But but basically what I hear you say is it's impossible to parse, uh, to take this apart. Like where is the, 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 the trauma that comes from the specific abuse of her family, of her alcoholic neglecting mother, uh, versus the the trauma of just living in these completely dismal circumstances every single day. I put up another slide. This is actually every, um, uh, South Africa today. So anyway, um, sorry to interject. Please carry on. Yeah, and I'm so glad that you say that, that there is a daily trauma for the majority of the people in this country who are living where... Um, the the political system has failed them and 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 the poverty is still so very rife um and and 
you know, the levels of violence are astoundingly high, and especially so for for black people. Um, and, you know, I mean, I guess some of what I was trying to do with the book is to say, I am not trying to resolve any of this. So a lot of it I kind of present to the reader and say, here is the story about this girl. This is her background. Um, and it's a very difficult background. She's had to deal with very difficult things. She's had to, her whole sense of identity um, has been questioned. She's, you know, been made, her, her life has been erased in some ways and is yeah. an, an, a new identity superimposed on her, what that might do to your sense of psyche. But at the same time, you know, Lolly also does really bad things. And I'm making this complex and laid and say to putting it, presenting it and saying to the reader, what do you make of this? You know, there's moral ambiguity here. Where, where might you feel empathy for Lolly? Where do you actually hold her to account? And I'm not on providing the answer to that. I'm asking you um, to think through that. We'd like to think that things, it's easy to think that things are black and white, um, but they often not, they're shades of gray. I can see a lot of uh, conservative folks reading this book or people who want to defund any type of social program using your book uh, as like, look, there's nothing we can do. These people are messed up to begin with. Look at them. Uh, what are we going to do? Let's let's save money and cut our losses. And you know, I mean, I, I have, for example, in my family, I have cousins who... So my dad's sisters, children who are gangsters, and I mean, that culture of poverty is what I'm referring. I mean, this is a term that comes. Yeah. From the US. I don't know if it's used in a South African context. Yeah. So, 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 for example, you know, like that that whole stereotype around, and, and particularly in our communities, like if you're poor and you're male, you're likely to become a gangster, and that has happened. You know, it's happened in my family. But those are also tropes, you know, and yes, there's poverty. And so, and obviously like the gangs, the gangsters become the role models in our communities and they're the ones who have money and, and who have power and to, to, to be initiated into them, you have to show that you be prepared, be, be, you are prepared to be violent, etc. cetera. Um, but, you know, it's not that easy. It's not all black boys grow up to be gangsters, right? It's, it's a lot more complex than that. They're the ones who, who, who don't. I mean, in my family, I managed to go to university. Um, I think that, you know, my sister and I are the only two, and we were the first. Um, and so that is a possibility. It's about that like, the story is not straight jacketed. There, are, there isn't necessarily a single path to follow. It's multi, you know, it's multi kind of faceted in terms of what might unfold. Absolutely. Um, I, it, it bothered me. We lived in California in a place where there's a lot of gang um, violence in the, in the Salinas Valley uh, area. And I found I found these answers so simplistic. And, you know, if you if you look at uh, if you grow up in, in, in gang culture and the, the peer pressure is there, the uh, also if your brother or if your older elder tells you, you, you know, deliver the drugs from A to B and you get, I don't know, 2000 cash. Uh, or you do um, you flip burgers at McDonald's for the rest of your life, or you have absolutely nothing. I mean, we see the slum here. So yeah, this is a really nuanced uh, question that that really demands of us to be uh, to have much more empathy and and really work on solutions, uh, not just these 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 darn tropes, as 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 you rightly put it. I, I want to. Put a put a quote out here um, that you um, that Shyla pulled from a interview. Our researchers Shyla or Monkey, both of them do uh, this background research. That I can't be bothered with Joy because I'm reading the books. Uh, uh, Lolly is very angry, and and this is a quote from you where you say, "There's this connotation that we are emotional beings, as if also that's a bad thing. Isn't it good to be emotional, right?" But when we dare to show anger and wrath, that seems to be a particularly bad thing. There's this sort of notion that a good woman and how we are meant to present in the world is as calm and good. In, and the concept of a lady, when you feel entitled and you own your anger, that's a problem and you're nasty. So I would like you to comment a little bit on, on, uh, on anger. I mean, anger is important, but we all know that... Uh, 
women who, who put their foot down are very often classified as, I don't know, difficult, hysterical, while men do the same thing. Um, and it's not a problem. Yes. Yeah, and they are to be admired because they're strong and show authority. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, it links this also to, to my kind of personal journey. So when, when I started um, studying at university, it was before um, uh, apartheid fell. And so it was a very white space. I'd never had the opportunity to interact with um, white children and white young people. And um, I lost my voice. You know, I would sit in group tutorials, never being able to say a word. And so it's taken me a long time to find my my voice and to and it really is the kind of um, politics and feminist politics specifically that has helped me do that. And and now I'm at the point where, you know, I am so centered in my voice, in what I feel, and that in um that it matters that um, you know, it 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 kind of pains me to watch especially black women, younger black women who are coming into that journey of finding their voice, how much we do to be nice, to placate, to be the good woman, to conform, to fit the mold, to rub you on your shoulder and you say, it's going to be okay. And um, when you st step on my foot and you say, does it hurt? It's like, no, it's okay, it will be fine. And it's just, you know, what happens when we dare to say, well, it's not okay. What happens when we dare to say we're angry, I'm pissed off, fuck off. Yeah, um, that that too is okay. And that, you know, working with the concept of how do you try not to do harm to others, but also to yourself. And I think that especially for people who come from kind of oppressed backgrounds, it's very easy to to be the person who is small, who doesn't want to be seen, who doesn't want to be heard, to be uh, pleasing and placating. And you know, the single biggest political message is you don't have to be, you can take up space in mm -hmm. the world. It belongs to all of us. Now, I can hear the voices uh, in my head. I mean, there I have a lot of voices in my head. I know, Joy, I should uh, take my medication. <laughs> Maybe the, the other dragster is talking. No, no, but uh, one thing that came up in our pre-production uh, meeting today was uh, very interesting where, where Shaila and I were talking and, and we're very aligned on this question. Uh, we talked a little bit about identity politics. Now we're talking about, you know, black people, uh, black women specifically, uh, but there's also uh, poor white people. There is uh, white women who, who have no say, usually poor. Um, I'll tell you right off the bat, I'm a little bit of a class reductionist. That's a term that the that my enemies use to to diminish um, what what sort of my cohort says. But but I would would like to ask you if um, when when somebody is empowered from from a group that is disenfranchised when that person is empowered but just follows you know the the dominant conservative or bad policy this is an easy softball question what is more important identity or policy you know let's let's envision a a black leader let's say where we go like oh my god now finally we have black leaders and that black leader just follows failed policy in terms of, you know, cutting social programs or whatever. And it's just a different colored face uh, perpetuating the same stuff that, that doesn't work. Yes, I think that what you say is important. That on the one hand, while we do need to look at intersectionality, which is the, the that meet, meeting point, the place where all our uh, the bits of our identities intersect. So, you know, sexual orientation, spatial location, is it? Well, those, that stuff is important. But it doesn't mean to say that you can't, uh, you know, that, that, that the worst kind of form of intersection, rural person, poor background, 
black whatever is going to necessarily be um, always have the model higher ground and so i think that what, what i guess what i should is, throw in a specific example let's imagine there's an there's a, uh, a, a, a a a trans woman is now heading the cia in america and is uh just continuing to torture people and and do imperial kind of stuff uh, does this mean we have finally accepted um, LGBTQ, uh, LGBTQ people in society? No. If 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 that person is just a uh, someone who no. is perpetuating th the same issues, then it has nothing to do with 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 uh, liberation and moving society to a better place, right? Absolutely. I think that the, the point that, that I'm trying to make is that uh, how do we center a critical power analysis in all that we do? So how do we work to shift the social reproduction of inequality? Um, and are we willing to experiment with ways of being and organizing and mixing that center justice and equity and power within elective forms of power and agency, I guess? Um, and yeah, like you know, I think that especially like looking at the kind of resurgence across the world in very problematic political uh, leadership values, um, a resurgence of kind of right wing uh, fascist values, that it becomes very important that we at this particular juncture, you know, given I mean, and it's 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 everywhere, right? Like yep. not just the, you know, like the Donald Trumps, it's, it's literally everywhere. So it's about how do we then hold that, that leadership accountable and how do we start reimagining and envisaging, envisaging a world where um, accountability is rooted in connection and care and power sharing and a commitment to yes. diversity in all its forms. Absolutely. Um, and it could even be that, that you know, again, like almost like in your book, I mean, I, I saw this in my, he in, in my head when I was reading your book. It's like, okay, if somebody comes from the kind of background that Lolly is coming from and she wants to climb the ladder, maybe she is hardened to, to an extent that when she gets to the top and to a powerful position, yes, here is a person from a minority background, uh, but she is maybe tougher you know, tough on crime or whatever, tougher uh, in 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 the in the the conservative sense, uh, restrictive authoritarian sense, than than anybody ever could. So you, I mean, you do have that sometimes. I mean, my my uh, personal uh, experience with immigration when I you know I'm a permanent resident of the United States, but whenever I come in, the people who look at my password and who give me a hard time, th they are often. Uh, they are they are minorities. It's not it's not the white guys. Uh, mm -hmm. They they seem to me like they want to prove to me and maybe to their superiors that they are they have absorbed what the the toughness they need to project that toughness as as um, practitioners of that of that power for the, for the state more than their white colleagues. Yeah. Anyway, that's just mm -hmm. a personal anecdote. Yeah, and in fact, you know, so in the in this book, I Lolly, in fact, in some ways, is a metaphor for um, how intergenerational trauma can mess with the psyche and cause the, a disruption, a distortion. Um, you know, when when the socioeconomic context and when you look to the people who are supposed to be leading, who are supposed to be caring for you, and I'll use this in a kind of metaphoric sense. In this case, it's Lolly's mother and and the leaders and the carers don't lead and they don't provide care. Yeah. Um, you never experience what, care. You never experience how it is to be to be loved. Exactly. So what is what is then what is then the implication and the the effects on the, the, on the psychological welfare of a person? And and then you know, so I want to kind of extrapolate that and think about it more collectively. So that's not only as an individual, but what happens in communities and societies where um, there is that kind of psychological disruption? What is the impact of that on a group of people? on a society, on a nation. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, like all those Trumpists, right, who stormed the, uh, who stormed the Congress, 
Yeah. What is what is the mental health implications of living in that mindset? Um, what can we say about our collective stories, our societal stories, our community community stories, and what they've done to us in terms of the collective psychological well-being? Very well put. This is exactly what we need to be thinking about because to to call everyone everyone a dumb idiot who is voting against their own interests, blah 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 blah, leads us nowhere. This is a, this is an adopted. Anyways, uh, Joy, a hundred percent. I agree with you a hundred percent. I I need to. The other dragster in my head says, dragster, don't go on a, a on a monologue. You have a wonderful guest here. If you're just tuning in, uh, this is Joy Watson talking about um, all sorts of really super interesting things. The Jumping Off Point being her debut novel, which is excellent. The Other Me, out now from Caravan Press. Uh, Karina Shurek is heading up Caravan Press. She's sitting here in the background. Um, Stranger is saying in the local chat just now, it's been pointed out that black cops in American cities tend to treat the people in black communities even worse than the white cops do. Uh, a great point, Stranger. There's a lot of other comments here. Uh, real quick, Shyla is saying, uh, if one was classified as white, what we talked about earlier, did they achieve equity or equality under apartheid? And Karina says, yes, if you were reclassified, you gained all the rights that a, that a white person has. I put up a... Um, a quote also that uh, that came up in the in the research quote from you joy here uh, talking here about um, you know trauma and 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 violence you're talking about peace work and you're saying in doing peace work we sort of strive how to rein in the violence and how to challenge how our emotions and uh, challenge our emotions and more constructive conduits but we have the propensity within all of us to be violent and it's through the consciousness of the of peace work and conflict resolution that we engage with how to manage that of course in society as a whole we're clearly not getting that right uh, correct so so it's not going very well but we should be trying or as the other cynical dragster says in my head come on joy what do you suggest sitting around singing kumbaya look at all the uh, look at all the post uh, apartheid violence um I actually Googled post-apartheid and looked at uh, what Google Images gave me. And what it gave me is this image here uh, from an article from The Guardian about school segregation that is that is uh, very, very bad. Um, it also showed me this image, white squatter camps. So white people are poor too. So th th you know, this is a post-apartheid uh, big area of conflict here as well. So I don't know uh, what the question is, but um, I think I guess I'm important. asking you because your day job is a, is a policy analyst, I guess. Uh, how can we solve yeah. this? White people, uh, you know, white people are struggling. For sure. But I think that the, the thing to point out here is that they have never been the victims of systemic um, racial oppression. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you might have some poor white people, right? But at scale, it is disproportionate to the systemic, uh, to the impact of systemic um, discrimination, which plays itself out over generations of people, right? Like, um, generally speaking, black people in this country don't have generational wealth to pass down in the same way that, that white people do. If you look yep. at the Johannesburg Stock Exchange and the companies registered there, like the research shows us that white people in this country, while black people might have political power, economic power, the, the hands of that has not changed. You know, we talk about this, the state capture and the corruption that goes on and how politicians have taken money, and sure they have, but when you look at the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, power is still vested with white people in this in this country. They still own the majority of the land, the assets, the wealth, um, and disproportionately, black people are still poor, except for a, a small elitist um, uh, middle class that's been created uh, after after 1994. So I think it's about like you know while we can can kind of point to the to those anomalies and say yeah for sure he yeah, is a white person poor white person, it is no way it's not fair to make the comparison with the impact of something that was systemic 
um, and entrenched and yeah, I mean, it just affected every part of your life and the shutting down of opportunities across generations where we feel the, the ripple down effect of that. Joy, thank you. This is this is a perfect answer. By the way, people are pointing out that I'm drinking a cocktail like a privileged uh, white person would in, in, in talking about the plight of, of black people. Uh, absolutely. I couldn't agree more with what you just said. I mean, this you know, my my provocative question was was akin to you know white lives don't matter. Um, yes, yes, they all lives matter. Yes, but we're now talking about uh, again generational trauma. We're talking about generational oppression, the 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 lack of opportunity to build intergenerational wealth. Um, yes, and a complex situation. Now. Uh, Let's go to another reading, and uh, we have about 20, 25 minutes. There's so much stuff. This is such a wonderful, incredibly illuminating uh, conversation. And 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 Peter uh, on the uh, YouTube chat says, I'm not well informed about the situation of colored agricultural workers in Africa or about the situation in general. Neither am I, neither am I Peter, uh, but we're learning so much. And this is going to be, you know, hopefully for, pe for people here in, in, in the audience, a way to 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 want to get uh, more informed about that situation. Matter of fact, uh, Shaila can already maybe put the Heinrich Böll um, link because Joy also uh, did some work for the Heinrich Böll Foundation. Heinrich Böll is uh, one of my favorite German uh, post-war authors, yeah. um, and the Heinrich Böll Foundation is is um, closely linked to the to the Green Party, uh, the German Green Party and other Green Parties in other countries. They do amazing work. They also have amazing uh, publications. Uh, but anyways, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that later. For now, let's do reading number two. This is chapter five. And this is a little bit later in the book. Again, no spoilers, but I mean, I guess people have already gleaned that Lolly's marriage to Sadiq is a little bit on the rocks. Um, and in this excerpt, we also encounter the the other lolly. So, uh, anything more to set up, or should we go 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 straight in? Yeah, I, I think that I chose this one because I wanted to introduce everybody to to the other lolly and give them the a little evil bit lolly. Of... Maybe the evil because the normal lolly is already evil. Is the <laughs> is the other lolly maybe more evil, or is she the good? Lolly? I don't know. I wanted things black and white, Joy. Why are you making things so complex? <laughs> <laughs> so complicated. I'm going to sleep tonight. Okay, so this is the reading. Um, on Friday night, I felt alone, which was unusual for me. Not wanting to sit around and mow, I decided to go out and party. I called to see her, but she was still not answering. I had given her enough chances. Who needs a friend who goes to because of a stupid dragonfly brooch? I put on a slinky black top and a pair of figure-hugging jeans and called an Uber to take me to town. Longstreet was pulsing. A group of excited teenagers jostled past, wearing short skirts that left nothing to the imagination, smoking, screaming at each other in unison. I made my way towards Singing Superstars, a karaoke club in Hope Street. Counting out the entry fee, I pushed past the woman at the door who looked like a cat had died. Making a beeline for the bar, I shouted that I wanted a Long Island iced tea, the caloric equivalent of 10 slices of bread. That's the thing about carbohydrates. You spend your whole life avoiding them, passing up on the fresh bakes and the roast potatoes. Then one day, you die. Thin and carbless, but nonetheless dead. The karaoke was picking up. Up on the stage, a nervous-looking woman in her early 20s was being pushed towards the mic by a group of eager onlookers. Wearing a puffed-out princess dress with a white veil and tiara, she was trying to balance in ridiculously high heels. The chords to Like a Virgin struck up. Stepping forward, she grabbed the mic and began to squeak about how she'd made it through the wilderness. Egged on by her friends, she relaxed, did a little swivel of her ass, the audience cheering her on. This was probably the last time she'd have fun before getting married. An hour later, I was swaying by myself in front of the karaoke stage. The bridal party was sozzled, doing rounds of shots. A really hot man in black jeans and a white t-shirt was on stage, 
singing James Blunt's latest hit, his voice smoky. His body was toned, clearly a gym guy. The thought of his legs wrapped round mine sent shivers up my spine. By midnight, singing superstars was a sweating, heaving mass of drunken people singing along. It took some pushing and shoving to force my way to the front of the bar. I just managed to yell out that I needed another Long Island iced tea when I heard my name on the loudspeaker. Lolly Higgins, you up next. I put my name down to sing Alicia Keys' Try Sleeping with a Broken Heart. Grabbing my drink, I made my way to the stage. This was my last chance to get James Blunt to notice me. The crowd was pumped up. Everyone cheered as I made my way to the mic. The flash of a strobe light threw me off balance, but I steadied myself, holding on to the mic. The backing music struck up. Something in, someone in the crowd clicked their fingers in anticipation, shouting, You go, girl! I started to sing, trying to follow the words on the screen in front of me. But something weird was happening. The musical chords were jumping away from the words. I did my best to match them up, but it was impossible. It had to be a technical glitch. I was going to have to go out on a limb and forget about the words on the screen. Why had the crowd stopped cheering? Fuckers. I'd give them something to cheer about. I lifted my top over my head, grappling to both rescue the mic and release the, the clasp of my bra. When I eventually managed to release my head from my top, I looked up and saw James Blunt looking stupefied. Next to him, leaning against the wall, in black leather pants, drink in hand, was other Lolly, rolling her eyes. As I threw my bra into the crowd, the women in the bridal party doubled over in laughter, tears streaming down their faces. I was about to start singing again, but other Lolly came slithering over. What the fuck do you think you're doing? She asked. Jesus, you're drunk. Put your top back on and call the ring to come and pick us up. Pulling my phone out of my pocket, I tried to find my contacts, but they seemed to have disappeared. Someone in the audience yelled, Get on the stage, you idiot! Pressing the call button, I yelled, Shut the fuck up! Can't you see that I'm trying to make a call? And I'll pause there. Wonderful reading. This is Joy Watson reading from The Other Me. I mean, it, 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 it's so good. It's so powerful. Here she's trying to... Um... Yeah, she's she, she's she's losing control is is all I can say, and 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 her life is is falling apart, and the other me is there. Uh, kitten here on the kitten do on the YouTube chat sh says Joy Watson sounds good, makes me think about uh, had I think and feel. Um, great reading. Uh, kitten is a big fan of um, of your voice, and and so am I, and I'm st I'm still drinking. Still, my avatar is drinking too much. Um, now, uh, here we also we we can see the anger. We 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 talked about that. One one question that came up. Uh, let me see where is it. Elians asked, "I would like to know if uh, how the book was perceived from people of color. Were there any specific reviews?" don't think that uh, there was a review where people sort of focused on on that but I have had um, I have had people who have said to me who come from the, you know the Cape Platts who have said to me that they really enjoyed firstly reading a book that is set in our country in our city because you know um, a lot of the time the stuff that gets marketed is the, the international stuff. And it's just so nice to find a sense of place um, that you know in a book. But also, I've had people um, from, from the Cape Flat say to me that to find, to find our community represented in the book with dignity means something to them. That, you know, often there are very oversimplistic tropes of how um, uh, kind of people are represented in the arts and literature, and um, and this this book seeks to to bring out the complexity that this is you know you you cannot use easy lazy archetypes and, and tropes to kind of flatten people the experiences and their stories. 
Hmm. Even by uh, even by authors who are. I mean, what's what's the is, is there a big scene of of black authors that that get heard that that get heard by you know they get reviewed because you're also reviewing. Oh, let me put up these slides here. You're reviewing um, uh, books for the Daily Maverick. I signed up for the Daily Maverick now. Uh, they're they're sending me newsletters. Okay. It, it looks like a great <laughs> paper. They do they do amazing research. You know, I was doing they they do investigative reporting. Here is uh here's a page from the Daily Maverick. This is the news uh, headlines, but they they have an investigative arm. So uh, that is very important, folks, to support uh, investigative journalism. Lots of um, lots of corporate uh, corruption here, uh, and and it seems that they're doing a good job. And you're doing these um, book reviews. So in your assessment, is there enough of a local voice of of people of different ethnic backgrounds, or yeah, not? That that it has been harder. For um, for black writers to to get notice and picked up, and I think that you know things are definitely starting to change. That you see a lot more writers and a lot and and, and very gifted, talented ones that could write really powerful pieces of work. I think that it it is at times harder to kind of break into the market as a black writer because um, you know. People who buy books, books are, are, are a luxury here, um, and and we, you know, we know we, who has kind of economic clout and power. So I think that it's very important to profile um, black writers. It's very important for publishers to 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 pick them up, and it's important to to profile their their work. Um, I mean, I love reading, and and that's why I do the reviews, um, and I'm very conscious. Of you know, while well, I will profile all writers, but I'm very conscious of asking myself how much of the content that I'm writing about is from South Africa, from the continent. Um, yeah, and I think that we we have to in how we consume books and how we purchase books, we have to be politically conscious as well. I mean, I, I remember going to a bookstore for my book club and the person telling me, "You're the only person we've ever seen take out." Books from the continent for mm -hmm. your book club, and that just from, from the library or from the store. Mm -hmm. From the store, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So support, support the, and and also just to say, independent publishing presses like Caravan Press that you know that give us a voice. Like it's it's so important to support those those books and those and publishers. Absolutely. Actually, if the camera can just uh, pan over the back here, um, the back wall, there is a bunch of different covers that I pulled from the Caravan Press website. Here, Beat, Roots, Theater Road are some of the titles here, A Fractured Land, Slaughterhouse, Let It Fall Where It Will, Death and the After Parties, Breaking Milk, Small Souls. There's also poetry. Um, wonderful stuff i think every purchase decision that a reader makes uh where you go with a independent press versus the big bestseller that is in the um in the airport <laughs> bookstore i mean sometimes you find good stuff at the airport bookstore too actually um Even though you have to actually search for those books so they're not the books that are profiled i mean the one that i just um recently read and and, and it's the next one that i will write about is a beautiful, exquisite. It's actually, I think, is my book of the year. Um, it's a caravan press title called Elton Bikies. So it's the name of a, a person, Elton Bikies, and it basically the book is is fiction, but it's um, it is uh, based on a, a true story that 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 happened where we had a station strangler who killed um, twenty two young black boys on the Cape Flats, and the talent, um, Lester's talent in writing this book, it just is exquisite, breathtakingly beautiful. Uh, say the title again, and I hope that maybe Monkey or or Shyla can can retrieve the um, can retrieve can retrieve a link. One thing that uh, that you touched upon a little bit, but I want to ask it um, explicitly. 
is, uh, and, and this was interesting because uh, we pulled a quote, uh, the research team pulled a quote that was on, on top of my mind as well, which is the fascinating question, why literature and stories can do so much uh, to explain and, and bring us viscerally in touch with an issue, uh, you know, that, that of, 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 of a slice of society that we're not uh, in ourselves. So we sort of teleport ourselves, we immerse ourselves in this, in this world. But fiction, literature, you know, lies, they can do that sometimes better than the best uh, well-researched sociological study. And in a previous interview, you actually said, uh, for me, writing is an agent for a feminist agenda. So how do you work towards transforming society but using the power of words to affect that change? That's what I try to do. And the book, the book mm -hmm. in general, the, the book as, as, as a medium is a different way of doing that because usually research pieces are a lot more not everybody's interested in them. They're important. We need knowledge. We need to generate knowledge in our society. But sometimes the arts and writing fiction and writing differently is a different medium in terms of access to how people think about certain issues. Now, aside from the fact that research studies are, are thick and uh, lots of pages and sometimes they're hidden behind paywalls in academia, but apart from from that access issue, what do you think that a, a made up story based based on on characters you know, but the characters in the book are are not real? What what makes those stories more real in a way? How how can they how they can can they uh, transport a, a a deeper truth? Yeah, so I think that, you know, I, I really do believe in the the power of storytelling to kind of make sense of the, the human experience, right? In some ways, we all, at some point in time, <laughs> go through moments of existential crisis, trying to work out why are we here? What's the point? What is our relationship with the world and others in it? And I mean, I just, I think back to my childhood, some of the most powerful moments are sitting on the floor and listening to the elders tell stories, like whether they were conscious of you being there or not. And by, and by stories, I mean trying to make sense of their experience or talking about things that happened to them, things that happened to the neighbors and the community. But it was this, this, this and, and, and conveying experiences that and stories that had been passed down to them as well. And you know, I think that there's something on the one end deeply um, nurturing and soothing in through the art of storytelling. And when we sit and we told um, a story, a metaphor that helps us make sense of um, a part of, of of what we we go through as human beings. And right, and it also grounds you. You bring up a great point because when you connect with your elders or with 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 your family or with your roots, where you come from, even if you're maybe you're in exile or, or or whatever, those those are the things that ground you and keep you grounded to to the earth and to your own identity. And and a research paper may I mean you may you may see yourself reflected in it. Uh, I'm a I'm a failed sociologist in the sense that that I uh, only studied it for three months and then I changed my major to music. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know I read that stuff and it's powerful and it's 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 important. But stories are are equally important. And I bump into very intelligent, wonderful people all the time who say, ah, now is not the time to read some made up crap. We need to study the facts. You know, and I think I don't know. You we I think we can walk and chew gum at the same time. In fact, so I read this book by um Johan Hari who called Start and Focus. And Oh, he... Johan Hari is always recommended. Who in the who in the book club always recommends Johan Hari? Raise your hand. No, sorry. Go ahead, Joy. This is hilarious that you bring him up. Go, go ahead. It might be Karina because she recommended it to me. Um, but it's a very powerful book explaining how, when you know that there is a, a system designed to um, to make us not be able to focus. Are we able to uh, have deep flow work less and less? Um, and and basically, he studies. You know, he gives you a, a couple of. Um, 
uh, reasons why this is the case. But one of the things that I've found, and some of the, you know, is the obvious, the obvious ones like social media and the power of all of that. Um, but the, one of the things that I found fascinating is that he talks about those who read fiction on the one hand, uh, showing how they are more likely to be able to engage in deep flow work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, secondly, how those who read fiction um, have been shown through research to have the ability to have more empathy. And so really it is about making sense of the human experience, helping us be better human beings. Um, helping make us make sense of the world we live in, but then there's so much more that we get from it. You know, I um, am, am, am just blown away by if the more I read fiction and stories, the more it enables me to show up empathetically in the world, but also the more it enables me to flow into a place of deep being, deep living, deep work, Living we, exactly, immersing, really yeah. traveling to other places in place and time. Yeah, exactly. And to to sit deeply in something, you know, yep. in a in a cultural phenomena of kind of ADHD, where nobody has the ability, ability to kind of focus on one thing for too long. Yep. Reading fiction helps you to be more deeply in a moment. Absolutely, it's a practice. It's really it it is so important. It's as important as yoga. Maybe it's more important than yoga. Yoga is all good. No, but absolutely. I mean, I could not agree more. This the kind of flow flow state, the single tasking, the the flexing that muscle that translates words, text, black on white paper into worlds in your mind is incredibly important. Absolutely. And I mean, you touched on my two morning things. Like when I wake up, I have um, reading time, I have a book, and then yoga, and then I'm ready to go. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, now we got to uh, put pedal to the metal. We only have a few minutes left. I'm so grateful for Joy's time. It's actually later uh, where Joy is. So uh, we, we don't want to uh, uh, steal your bedtime. Let's let's give a round of applause for for. Um, Joy's avatar, who looks exactly like her in real life. Look at this. Isn't this crazy? I think Isabel uh, put your avatar together. Isabel um, took off 20 years. She took off a good 20 years. No, 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 no. I don't I don't see. Pictures don't lie, Joy. Now, Thank you, uh, Isabel. I love you, Isabel. <laughs> um, and also, I actually found out that Jessica Jean-Vive is always in my ear with the Johan Hari. Now, I think finally I have to... Um, I have to... Uh, give up and and actually read them. Uh I have here an important question on on my on my run sheet that I want to ask about feminism because you 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 uh, uh you you self classify as a feminist researcher and you have a uh a piece in the from the Heinrich Böll Stiftung reclaiming the uh or claiming back the F word is is one article. These are freely accessible through the Heinrich Böll Foundation by the way. A very interesting stuff. Um there's an, uh, is another one here. I'm putting up the slides here. Maybe the camera can focus on it. Uh, no women, no peace. This is a profile of a, of a peacemaker. We were, ta we were talking about peacemakers earlier. This is a profile about Nomarusha Bonasse. Super interesting stuff. You were mentioning earlier um, intersectionality. My, my wife is back in, in school at, uh, at the age of, uh, well, you, you don't say a woman's age but uh, she's not uh, 22 anymore, let's put it that way. And she's studying um, social work and uh, she wrote a paper about intersectionality. Let me first ask you another super broad question. What is feminism? <laughs> what does feminism mean to you? And then the related question, can feminism be non-inclusive? You have two minutes. Yeah, God, so this feminism. is like a game show. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Feminism to me means making, reimagining the world so that, you know, it's a different place for the women who are to come. It means remembering the women who have gone um, and whose backs, you know, the, the our society is built on in a nutshell. Um, I try to not just write feminism, I try to live my feminism. But let me say, there are many moments when I get it wrong. 
where I'm dancing to bad music with the horrible words. And it's okay to get it wrong sometimes, as long as, you know, the overall goal is to believe in a different kind of world with the way we address systemic in- inequity. Mm-hmm. But feminism can also be uh, exclusion, uh, excluding people. Uh, sometimes feminism can be, um, you know, by good meaning, uh, women from a certain class background, maybe let's just say white middle class women who are uh, possibly excluding uh, poor women uh, of color and those kind of things. So you mentioned intersectionality. Maybe my question is, what does intersectionality mean and, and why is it so important? So, I mean, you know, for, for a long time, uh, there was a debate around this word feminist and um, and with black feminists not identifying. And then there was also a point in time where people identified as womanist. But really, intersectionality now looks at how do we make our feminism inclusive? How do we look at, um, how do we center a critical power analysis in what we do? And how do we look at the intersections between identity, between race, spatial location, sexual orientation, class? Um, and, and, and even, you know, the kind of feminism that I believe in, and I, I, I've, I've heard these debates in the feminist world that sometimes it's not a safe place for trans women, but, you know, an inclusive feminism includes all people who identify um, as women, and that is including trans women. And also, so I think that the people who don't defy, identify as anything at all, who are non-binary, like that's also okay. And how do we, how do we center a power analysis in all these intersections of identity. It's no longer as simple as being binary um, man and woman. Um, so, yeah, like that's going to be complicated for you, Dexter, because, you know, when it gives you the options now, you sit um, gal guy, you're going to have yeah. to do binary mm-hmm. and and like some other stuff. Absolutely. I'm the kind non-binary. of guy who goes to, I, you know, I'm going to go <laughs> shopping. If I want to buy a T-shirt, uh, I don't want too many options. I I, I want a nice uh, white button-up or a gray button-up. I mean, uh, why do we need all these choices? Uh, no, this is this is very well put. And I guess also really the message here is to to always be ready to to reflect on your own privilege. I mean, I guess that that is uh, that's the way to 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 check yourself, check your privilege, just, re- just really. Yeah. make that a sort of a daily practice um in closing i also want to encourage folks to read uh because maybe the camera can zoom on the table here you uh co-edited a, a collection it's called nasty women talk back that's also available in stores and um online is a um I guess it's a it's an, uh, a short version of of your essay called "Pussies Are Not for Grabbing." This this is very a, a very interesting read, and now I forgot which website is on it, it is on. It's not in my notes. It's it's an online magazine. Um, I think that, that one was published uh, by a newspaper called Mail and Guardian. So if you search ah. for that essay, it will yeah you'll get the Mail and Guardian piece. Yeah, if you search the title exactly, you'll 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 get that piece. Um, yeah, uh, you know, so much, so much more to talk about. But we need to wrap it. Um, last words, Joy. I hope you enjoyed uh, your stay here, and I hope you come back, and and I hope you're, you you keep writing, and and you have a lot of success so that you can afford to keep writing. You know, behind every behind every female writer is either a trust fund uh, or a Karina Schurek who is uh, cracking the whip. Where is your next book? The next book is is way um because there's actually a different project, a new collection of essays on social equity that we're going to be putting out next year. And then the 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 novel after that, the like I've slowly, painstakingly started working that um mm-hmm. so that I kind of hold it and remember it. Um, but I've got that story that yeah, we just need there's not enough time in the day, is there? It, it it really isn't. I mean, this is my my mystery is when people say, "Oh, yeah. I binge watched uh, this show," or uh, I don't know. Anyways, I don't want to get into that. People can do whatever they want. I suggest um, what Joy suggested: start your day with, if you can. I know everybody has to make a living. A lot of 
us are stuck in jobs that we don't like, uh, where we coerce to, to do these jobs to keep a roof over our head. But you will find time in the day to carve out for yourself uh, and uh, you use that time to be to 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 get intimate with a book. I suggest um, it it really does help. Joy, uh, thank you again, and thank you, Karina uh, Schurek as as well, who is somewhere here in the audience. Maybe the maybe the camera can zoom over Karina uh, Schurek, who is the proprietor of Caravan Press, and you can find the Caravan Press titles in uh, selected uh, fine bookstores all over South Africa. And if you're not in South Africa, you have to go to the big A uh, word uh, online and buy it there. Um, but you should. Uh, thank you. Thank you, audience. Thank you, everyone, for coming. This is a, this is a huge turnout today. Uh, lots of new faces. Thank you so much for coming. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And do come back. We do this every Wednesday. Big thanks to the folks on uh, on, on YouTube. Big thanks to Kitten Duo, who is a uh, Drax fan for 12 months now. And uh, Elian uh is a drax bro now what what is that all about that is about supporting this channel this is a volunteer effort if you like the show if you like what we do you can support us by becoming a member of the youtube channel and slash or donating tipping here and i just noticed we don't we don't have a tip jar here oh jesus christ um, well, if you have loose Linden dollars um, in your pockets, please give them to Shyla the Super Gecko. Uh, and Shyla, part of the research team, will uh, very evenly hand this out to the to the team. Now, the Second Life Book Club is happening every Wednesday at 12 o'clock. I'm going to run through the credits real quick. The email is slbookclub at dragster.com. You can uh, write us suggestions, um, critique, et cetera. The show is produced by Isabel Sharen, Shyla the Super Gecko, and myself. Location manager, master builder is Ruby Geek. Today, it's also Isabel. She built this house and uh, decorated this house. Avatars are made by Ruby and Bespoke Caravan. Well, today, also Isabel. Research for the show is by Shyla the Super Gecko and Monkey. Big thanks to uh, Monkey, who has been on the team for a while now. The Second Life Book Club is sponsored by a whole bunch of different people, but specifically uh, by Bespoke Caravan, makers of amazing, fantastical avatars. This is the little ad slide that they gave me. Just absolutely amazing um, avatars. And the other sponsor that we have, and let me look for the for the ad, is the Black Forest. I can't find the slide right now, but the Black Forest is a Second Life vendor who makes amazing board games. So you'll find that on SL Marketplace. Please find the calendar Discord Flickr on a sandwich board scattered around the island. Again, SL Book Club at dragster.com. Forgot to put out the tip jar today. So please uh, give your, give your hard earned Linden dollars if you like books and if you like this show to Shyla the Super Gecko. Now, next week we have uh, Cortia Newland. Cortia Newland is an amazing writer. His book, um, A River Called Time, one of the best books I read uh, in 2021. It's a huge, it's a huge book that he worked on for, I think, 15 or 16 years. He'll tell us about it. Cortia Newland also writes for television. He, he created the show Small X with Steve McQueen fantastic uh, program that even I watch who usually don't watch as television. Cortia Newland will be back here on the book club next week with his short story collection Cosmogramma. Really good stuff. So I'm very much looking forward to that. And that concludes the program. Thank you and uh, goodbye, everybody. <laughs>